Okay, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hernando County. And welcome to this morning's class. I know many of you have probably been here before, either to classes at our office, live and in person, or here on Zoom or through Facebook Live. Hopefully this is working correctly through Facebook Live. It was a little twitchy this morning, so hopefully it'll come through. Um, want to remind everybody that we have everybody's um, microphones and cameras turned off. If you can go ahead and keep them off, that would be great. It really helps to um, keep me focused and not distract anybody when we're going through this. Now, we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see the little box that says chat, go ahead and click on that and you can type your questions in and then we'll go ahead and answer questions at the very end. But let's go ahead and get started here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And there we go. Okay, today we're going to be talking a little bit about how to care for your spring vegetable garden. Hopefully, everybody has their spring vegetable garden in already. I'm running really late. I'm still putting things in. But hopefully, everybody's vegetable garden looks just like this at this point, right? Everybody's um, garden is all planted and looks beautiful and everything's healthy and growing. Don't feel bad if it doesn't because I've never had a garden that looked this good. But it's very important. We're gonna cover just a few things today about how to go about caring for your vegetable garden. If I can make this advance. There we go, okay. Just have to hit the button a little bit harder, I guess. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about today, I'm just gonna cover three main important areas. And that's, it all starts with timing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what you wanna be growing this time of year and what you don't wanna be growing. Because here in Central Florida, over the entire year, we can grow just about any kind of vegetables here. Um, let's see, rutabagas is one thing that comes to mind that you can't grow here, but really everything else you can grow here if you do it at the correct time of year. And a lot of people will um, try growing things in the raw season, and then they end up having a lot of problems with their garden. So we're gonna start with that. Then we're going to cover a couple of really common insect pest problems, and I'm going to give a couple of really specific recommendations for what you want to do to control them. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the common disease issues, because once we start to get a little further into spring, the weather gets a little bit warmer, gets a little bit more humid, uh, you start getting those afternoon rains. For a lot of different crops, you're going to have a lot of different disease issues, and that's something that tends to confuse a lot of people. They're not really sure what to do or how to identify them. There we go. So when we're talking about what we wanna be growing right now, this is just about May 1st. So we are in spring. Spring sometimes lasts only about two weeks here in Central Florida, then we head straight into summer. But you wanna be growing things from this list right now. Things like beans, they could be green beans, pole beans, cantaloupes, any kind of melons, corn, if you're daring, corn could be really difficult for a home gardener to grow in their home garden because it does have a lot of different insect pests. But corn obviously grows very well here. We have a number of you pick corn farms right here in Hernando County. Cucumber, Eggplant, I have some eggplant plants coming up and they're doing beautifully. Eggplant is very easy to grow, has a few problems, but overall pretty easy. Okra, the next two, okra and southern peas. Southern peas are also known as black eyed peas. They are the only two vegetables that are gonna do really well here 
once we start to get really hot, I'm talking June, July, and August, because okra is a tropical vegetable. So it doesn't mind the heat, humidity, the rain every single day. It's gonna do pretty well even during the hottest part of summer. Peppers, those would be green peppers, color peppers, hot peppers. I have a lot of hot peppers planted in my yard. I'm hoping they're gonna do well. Sweet potatoes, sweet potato is another tropical type of vegetable. If you plant them in the spring, they're gonna grow just fine all summer when it gets really hot. You're gonna dig them up and harvest them in the fall. Pumpkin, squash, that would be summer squash like yellow squash and zucchini or winter squash like um, acorn squash, Hubbard, spaghetti squash, varieties like that. Tomatoes, hopefully you already have your tomatoes up and growing and in the ground. Hopefully if you're starting them from seed, you started them a couple months ago because as we're gonna see, once we start to get really hot, June, July, and August, tomatoes are not gonna do really well here. And watermelon, of course, watermelon does very well in Central Florida. So these are all the cool season vegetable crops, and these grow just great over the winter. And when we say cool season, that generally means September or really October 1st up until March 15th at the latest. <clears throat> So we're obviously past, well past March 15th. We're heading into May right now. So all these different things, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, all the different greens, lettuce, peas and snow peas, beets, carrots, spinach, turnips, turnip greens, mustard greens, collard greens, they all do really, really well here during the winter when the weather is cool. Once the weather starts to heat up, they're going to decline pretty quickly. So you really don't want to try to keep those cool season crops going this time of year. And I know a lot of people do. Um, but what happens is the weather starts to heat up. We start to get into later spring, heading towards summer. And a lot of those cool season crops start to have huge insect and disease problems. And what happens is a lot of people are tempted to try to control those problems with chemical insecticides more fertilizer, more water, thinking that that's gonna solve the problem, but it isn't. The problem is that the weather has just gotten too hot to grow those crops. And even if you can keep the lettuce and kale and the last year cabbage and the other things kinda sort of going alive and going along, when you do pick them, they're gonna be very, very poor quality. They're not gonna taste very good. A lot of the lettuce and greens start to get a very, very strong taste to them. So when we get up into this time of year, you wanna take a hard look at those cool season crops that may still be in your garden and plan on picking them and replacing them with something like green beans or uh, possibly summer squash, getting a little bit late for that right now, but you may wanna replace it with a warm season crop because it's not a very good use of that limited space that's in your garden because most people have gardens that are of limited size and spaces at a premium and you wanna grow, you wanna really focus on the correct crops for the correct time of year to get the best possible harvest out of them. So here's a very good example of what can happen if you try to keep things like cabbage, broccoli, uh, turnip greens, kale going until too late. You have problems with a huge number of insects. Probably the worst one is harlequin bugs which are very colorful and very pretty bugs. But all of a sudden, if you have any of those greens still in your garden going right now, you're gonna to start to see harlequin bugs. And you see the picture on the right here, that's feeding damage from them. You, I've seen Colorado potato beetles, yellow margin leaf beetles on all these different green uh, leafy crops. And they're never a problem during the winter. If you're growing, um, these cool season crops during, let's say, November, December, January, and February, these insects are not out. They come out in the spring. So if you start pushing the season a little bit too far, you're all of a sudden gonna start to have huge insect problems and you're gonna have to control them. Otherwise, they're gonna ruin what's left of your crop. So seriously think about going out this weekend, harvesting the last of those cool season vegetables, and moving on, moving more into the warm season vegetables that we wanna have out there now. So a little bit about insect pests 
And I even include here uh, imaginary insects. I speak to a lot of people who will either call or email and they say, I have a problem in my vegetable garden, my tomatoes or peppers or this and that don't look right. What do I spray for the insects? And I ask, well, do you have a problem with insects? They go, well, I don't know. Maybe, I'm not really sure, but um, I have a problem with my crops, so it must be an insect pest. Well, not necessarily. You have to actually check your plants, see if you have problems with insects or not. If you do have insects, you need to properly identify them to figure out the proper control. And we're gonna see, I've kind of broken up insects into a couple of large general groups. So one big general group that could be major pest here in Florida are stink bugs and all their friends. So um, stink bugs come in a lot of different shapes, sizes, colors. The only adult one here in these four pictures is the one in the upper right, the uh, southern green stink bug, that's an adult. The other three are immature stink bugs. And stink bugs, obviously, as they grow, they get larger and they change colors also. So it's a little difficult to become familiar with identifying the exact species of stink bug that you have, but almost all of them are gonna be a pest in your vegetable garden. What happens is they all have a piercing sucking mouth part. So if you're growing things like eggplants, tomatoes, beans, um, squash, they're gonna get on the plants, they're gonna poke into the leaves and the stems, and they're gonna suck the juices, the water and the nutrients out, and they're gonna poke into the fruits also. They could be a huge problem with things like tomatoes and peppers because every time they poke into a tomato, it leaves a hole in the fruit that's a perfect place for bacteria and fungi to get into that fruit. So a lot of times your tomatoes will grow and become larger and you're gonna be able to pick them but they don't look very good. They look like they've been poked all over because they have been by stink bugs and some of their other closely related insect pests. Here's a picture of leaf footed bugs. And these are very common out in the garden also, but they change as they grow also. So the picture on the left here is from my garden from a couple years ago. This is a picture of an eggplant and you see all these little tiny immature leaf footed bugs on it. They're all bright orange, they have black legs. When they grow larger and become adults, they're gonna look like the one on the right. So they look totally different, totally different colors. They're a lot larger. When they're adults, they have wings, but they have piercing sucking mouth parts also, and they're gonna do the same type of damage to all your tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. They're gonna poke into them and damage them that way. So we have a lot of other insect pests that are basically very tiny little insect pests. So I kind of, it's easiest to lump them all together in one group. Aphids, any gardener is probably familiar with aphids because you can tell even from the pictures right here, aphids come in a variety of colors, shapes. The ones on the left here, the very brightly colored orange ones are oleander aphids, anybody who has milkweed in your garden, you will see them on the plant. The bottom center here is a hibiscus flower and you see aphids are all on the flower bud. They're gonna poke into that flower bud, damage it and probably make the flower bud drop off before it blooms. <clears throat> Some of the ones on the right here are um, green peach aphids. They're very common. The one in the center on the top are black. I think they might be potato aphids but it doesn't matter. Here in Florida, we have a lot of different species. They come in a rainbow of different colors and they're very, very common on pretty much everything that you may have in your yard, including your vegetables. If you're checking your vegetable plants and looking through your garden, they're gonna generally congregate on the new growing tips. So they really, really prefer that new foliage. They poke into the new growing tips. They suck out the, um, the water the juices, the nutrients in your plants, they damage the brand new leaves and the little flowers that are coming out on your vegetables. They cause them to curl and distort and they can be very damaging. Now, fortunately with aphids, there are a ton of different insects out there that prey on them and eat them. I'm sure everybody's familiar with ladybugs. Ladybugs gobble up aphids. Aphids are like one of their favorite things to feed on. So if you're out there checking your garden, 
and you see a plant that has a lot of aphids on the growing tip, but you also see a lot of ladybugs, the ladybugs probably have them under control. One ladybug can eat, I think it's about 10 to 20 aphids per day. So pretty quickly they can clean up a small infestation of aphids. But if you have a huge number of aphids on your plants, you're probably gonna have to treat for them. So keep in mind, tiny insects are tiny. They're very, very hard to see and notice, you know, with the naked eye. So you're going to need to get a hand lens or a magnifying glass. So when you're out there checking your garden, looking through the plants, you can use that magnifying glass and catch any little tiny insects when there's only a few of them and they're very easy to control. Because otherwise what happens is from some of these pictures here, you can tell these are very, very large groups of aphids. If you have a lot of aphids, they become very, very difficult to control and get back under um, control and protect your plants. Mealybugs. Mealybugs are very common out in the garden. Not so much on vegetables, but I went ahead and threw these in anyway. These are very common on a lot of different ornamental plants out in your yard, things like hibiscus and firebush. So they can be a problem. They look like they're little chunks of cotton. So they, they're usually white. And a lot of times they create a little cottony mass that they live under and hide under. So if you look on your plants and you see what looks like little chunks of cotton on the stems or underneath the leaves, it may be a problem with mealybugs. And spider mites. Spider mites are a very common problem. Spider mites have a huge host range of plants. I think it's about, there's a thousand different species of plants that they will feed on including a lot of things that are in your vegetable garden. So spider mites will start to come out and emerge and become a little bit of a problem starting in the spring around now. Their populations go up and up and up. They become the worst out in your garden in the heat of summer because they like it when it's really, really hot. So as a general rule, August and September is when we see the most problems with spider mites. See the picture on the right here of spider mites, and this is magnified. They could be very hard to see. So if you look on the left here, you can see the webbing that they start to make when you have a lot of spider mites on your plant. And the spider mites are the little tiny dots on there. And if you looked at that under a microscope, you'd see spider mites, you'd see their eggs, you'd see their shed skins. They make a big mess, basically. So spider mites, if you're looking at them with a hand lens or magnifying glass, they have eight legs. Any kind of insect pest is gonna have six legs. As a general rule, keep in mind there's always, you know, exceptions to every rule when it comes to any kind of biological organism out in your yard. But as a general rule, spider mites are the ones with eight legs. They make the webbing, but when they start making noticeable webbing, that means you have a lot of spider mites and they're going to be really tough to get rid of. So you need to be diligent, keep checking your plants. And when you start to get a little bit of a problem with spider mites, go ahead and treat that. And like I said, I'm going to cover the general treatments that are going to solve all these different pest problems that we're talking about here today. <clears throat> so white flies. White flies are another major insect pest. And the picture on the right here is what they look like. We have a couple different species of white flies here in Central Florida. They're pretty easy to tell if your plants have white flies or not. If you go along and you have, let's say, tomatoes or peppers or green beans, if you just lightly tap the plants and you see these tiny little white things come flying out from underneath the plants and start flying around, they're most likely white flies. If you look at them uh, underneath the leaves, which is where they live, with a hand lens or a magnifying glass, they're going to look like the ones on the right here. And they can make a little bit of a mess too. They'll start to make like cottony white debris. Immature white flies are pretty distinctive. What they look like is a little white pancake on the underside of the leaf with two little tiny red eyes looking up at you. So that's kind of, you know, distinctive of white flies. White flies will feed on your plants and damage them that way but they are especially bad with a lot of vegetables because what they do is they vector or transmit viruses from plant to plant. So the picture on the left here is a, of a tomato plant that has tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And when your tomato plant gets this viral disease, there is nothing you can do. 
There is no treatment. There is no spray. You cannot fix that tomato plant. What you want to do is promptly pull it up out of the ground and throw it away in the trash because otherwise white flies are going to spread it to all the rest of your tomato plants and potentially pepper plants also. So some of the symptoms of that disease is the leaves turn very, very yellow. The picture on the left here really doesn't do it justice. I've seen plants before that are just really, really bright, almost neon yellow. The leaves, the new leaves are very, very small. They're curled, they're distorted. <clears throat> so white flies are especially bad in the garden because they vector a lot of different diseases. And the diseases they vector don't just affect tomato plants. Some of the worst ones and um, most economically important for commercial growers are for things like watermelon, other kind of melons, summer squash, things like yellow squash and zucchini. So white flies are really, really bad. You need to keep them under control in your garden and you need to be very diligent keeping your eye out and catching them when you only have a few and getting rid of them then. So caterpillars, what's that kid's book or the kid's story, The Hungry, Hungry Caterpillar? Well, that's a pretty appropriate name because caterpillars in your garden can be very, very hungry and eat a lot. So this picture here, I'm sure for any gardeners who have grown tomatoes before, you recognize what a either tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm caterpillar are. They look a little bit different. The color is, colorizing on them is a little bit different. That's how we could tell the difference. But it doesn't matter. If you get either one on your tomatoes, they will eat all the leaves off and leave your tomato plant just basically stems and sticks very, very quickly within a day or so. So these are caterpillars that you need to keep an, your eyes open for and catch very, very early. Now, large caterpillars, I've always found that physical control works very well. Basically, what you do is you pick them off and you throw them over the fence. I've spoken with a lot of people. If anybody has chickens and you pick caterpillars off your plants, apparently chickens really, really appreciate them. They will gobble them up also. So these are all uh, very low toxicity, very safe physical ways of controlling them. But some caterpillars can be a bit smaller. Here's one uh, that is a huge problem whether you're growing corn or tomatoes. So this is one species of caterpillar that turns into a very small brown moth. And if this caterpillar is feeding on your corn, the common name is a corn earworm. And if it's feeding on your tomatoes, we call it a tomato fruit worm. It's the exact same species. So obviously it will feed on corn, it will feed on tomatoes, it will feed on peppers, it will feed on a variety of different vegetable crops. <clears throat> so getting down to the important information here about how you deal with some of these different insect pests. Uh, I talked about stink bugs and beetles. They tend to be larger insects. So if you treat them with a product called pyrethrin, not pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are something different. That's basically uh, a man-made version of pyrethrins, but pyrethrin is a natural substance. It comes from a species of um, South African chrysanthemums, I believe. So it's derived from a plant and it's very toxic to slightly larger insects, things like stink bugs, leaf-footed bugs, and beetles. And you wanna get a product that has piperonyl butoxide in it. So a lot of products, if you, if you go to a store and find a, a product that has pyrethrin in it, or if you look online, a lot of times it comes with a piperonyl butoxide in it. The combination of those two works really well because if you go out there and like, if you remember that picture I showed with all the little immature leaf footed bugs on my eggplant plant. If you go out there with pyrethrin, with piperonyl butoxide and start spraying them, boom, they will drop right off the plant. It has really, really good knockdown abilities. You have to actually hit the insect with the spray, but when you do, they will drop right off the plant very quickly. The problem is if you're using just pure pyrethrin, about half of them will magically come back to life. It won't completely kill them. But if you use a product with the combination of the two, it will knock them down and kill them so that they won't 
magically come back to life and come back up on your plants. So it works very well with any kind of insecticide. This is very, very important. You have to read the directions very carefully. Make sure that you use whatever kind of protective equipment because even with low toxicity sprays, you don't want to be out there in your shorts and flip flops and tank top and you know no gloves on you do need to wear protective equipment but if you follow the directions and you um actually wear the protective equipment and you do things that the way you're supposed to you can use these products very safely and they're also going to be very effective on specific pests so you need to know what your pest is for us to be able to recommend a specific effective control here if you use insecticidal soaps on some of these larger insects like stink bugs and beetles, if it's a very small immature stink bug, it's gonna work okay. But once they get a little bit larger and older, they tend to have a thicker cuticle or a thicker skin. So soaps are not gonna work very well to actually kill them. It might make them angry, but it's not gonna control them very well. And let me mention things like neem oil. Neem oil is a fine, um, control for certain insects. It's kind of a mixed bag. Neem oil works very well on some things, but not very well on other things. But once we start to get to this time of year where the temperature starts to go up, the sun's intensity starts to get a little bit stronger, we're moving a little bit further into spring, a little bit closer in towards summer, you really can't use any kind of oils in your garden. Because what happens if you go to the beach and you're out there enjoying a beautiful hot sunny day at the beach and you cover yourself with something like baby oil, what happens? You fry. The same thing is going to happen to your plants. A lot of plants, if you use any kind of oil spray on them and it's very hot, it's very sunny, you will fry your plants. So we're coming up on the time of year where you really don't want to be using products like neem oil because what they're going to do is they're going to have a phytotoxic effect on your plants and they're gonna basically sunburn or fry your plants. So you need to be very, very careful with the use of oils um, from this point in the year on. Oils work great during fall, winter, up until early spring. If you do really wanna use neem oil or some type of oil product, what you wanna do is go out there and spray a leaf or a little bit of your plant, wait a day or so and make sure the oil doesn't damage your plant and then determine if it's safe to spray the entire plant or not. So we're coming up to the time of year where I'm not saying neem oil doesn't work, it's not safe to use because it is, it's just we're getting to a time of year where it might not be a good idea to be spraying this on your plants. I've seen people use neem oil once we get up, to, up into a little bit hotter time of year, closer to summer on beans, and they fried the heck out of their beans. It looked like they used a flamethrower on them did major damage to it. <clears throat> so with those little tiny pests I talked about, the things like aphids, mealybugs, white flies, uh, spider mites, insecticidal soap works very, very well on them. Insecticidal soap is a perfect control for very small, soft-bodied insects because what it does is it actually burns through their cuticle or their skin and causes them to dehydrate, and that's how it kills them and controls them. A lot of people really like to mix up a mixture of a tablespoon or two of Dawn dishwashing detergent and water. That works, and it's not particularly dangerous for your plants. It can be, sometimes it's a little bit phytotoxic also. Obviously, it's pretty safe for you. If you can use Dawn dishwashing liquid in the kitchen to wash your dishes, it's probably fine if you're using it out in your garden also. It really doesn't work as well as insecticidal soap. They're two, chemically, they're two different products. So the commercially made insecticidal soap is going to be more effective. Like I said, it's perfect for small soft-bodied insects. And once again, it's still getting too hot for neem oil. So neem oil would technically work well on those insects also, but we're getting to the point of year where it might just damage your plants and you want to think long and hard before using that neem oil.
So caterpillars, caterpillars are really, really easy for us to suggest to control for. If your problem is a caterpillar, what we recommend to use to control it is BT. It's that simple. BT is short or stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And Bacillus thuringiensis is a species of bacteria that's natural in the environment. Researchers and specialists years ago found a way to take this bacteria and stabilize it. It makes um, spores, it makes resting spores. So they take those spores, they put it in a product, they're able to bottle it and make a shelf stable so that you can go to the store or you can go online and purchase a bottle, follow the directions, mix the recommended amount with water, spray it on your plants. And what happens is when a caterpillar eats the leaf that has the BT spray on it, they will over one or two days get sick. And the first thing they do is they quit feeding. The second thing they do is pass away. So BT is approved and labeled for organic crop production. It only kills caterpillars. So if you're worried about spraying and having a caterpillar ingest it, and then maybe a bird or a lizard or something else comes along and eats it, BT is not, it's not dangerous to birds or lizards. Generally very safe for people to mix and apply as long as you follow those directions very carefully. With caterpillars, soaps and neem oil are somewhat effective in sexicidal soap. Unless it's a very small young caterpillar, it's only going to make the caterpillar angry and sticky and nasty, but it's not going to kill it. So by far the best and quickest and most effective control for caterpillars, any kind of caterpillar is going to be BT. So that's definitely something that you want to have in your um, toolkit basically for pest control. So very quickly, some general pest or general disease issues that you're gonna run across in your garden. Fungal leaf spots, and this is a picture of a tomato plant here, and this is early blight or alternaria. Very, very common um, fungal disease of tomatoes. It can also be a uh, pest of peppers and a lot of different plants. So a lot of vegetables in your garden are going to start to get fungal leaf spots on them. And they're all different species of fungi, but it really doesn't matter what species of fungi it is. What they do is they cause little spots on your leaves. The spots are going to grow and get larger. They're going to join together and then they're going to damage uh, the leaves. The leaves are going to fall off. It's going to eventually kill your plant. So what you want to do for fungal leaf spots, we're going to get to in a moment. Fungal leaf spots can be very, very damaging, and they're really, um, they become a huge problem once the weather starts to, starts to change a little bit, and the weather starts to warm up, and it becomes more humid, and we start to get more regular rain, especially when it rains late in the day or early in the evening, because all fungi really like it when it's warm, when the humidity is high, and when there's free moisture or standing water or raindrops on the leaves, that is when it seems like overnight, boom, all of a sudden your plants start to get these spots on them. The spots grow and spread, the leaves fall off, your tomato plants, your squash plants are all dying. You're gonna have to take appropriate steps to either try to prevent them or um, avoid it for as long as you can, or you're gonna have to treat to help to save your plants. There's a very blurry picture of powdery mildew on some squash plants. So that's another very common fungal problem too. And then the other major fungal type of problem you're going to get is root rots. And th there's a lot of different species, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Phytophthora. What these fungi do is they are in the soil. And when your plants are too wet, or when the weather is just right, they're all of a sudden gonna be a problem and they're gonna damage your problem, your plants by damaging the roots. They cause the roots to rot and all of a sudden one day your entire plant wilts and falls over and it was because of a root problem. So the only and best ways to help control disease problems in general, the, the way you wanna look at it is if possible, 
when you're picking the different varieties of plants and vegetables you're going to grow in your garden, always look for disease resistant varieties. You know, different varieties are resistant to different diseases because there are a huge number of different specific vegetable garden diseases out there. As a general rule, the more resistant the variety is to the more diseases, the better. Every little bit helps when it comes to resistance. You wanna to try to plant these different crops early in the spring. If you remember all the way back when I was talking about timing and picking and growing the correct crops at the correct time of year, for a lot of things like tomatoes and cucumbers and summer squash and watermelons, the earlier in the spring you can plant them and get them in, the, the better jump they're going to get on growing larger and flowering and fruiting before the weather becomes really, really conducive for diseases because we're just about to get into disease season. So you want to get your plants in. I know here in Hernando County and for anybody watching from Central Florida, the best time to put these warm season crops in is end of February, very beginning of March. So if you start put, thinking that you're going to plant beans and cucumbers and things in May or June, that's way too late. After you plant them, you're going to have huge problems with diseases along with insects. You want to get these crops in early to try to avoid disease season as much as you can. <clears throat> irrigation management. Drip irrigation works best for vegetable gardens. You can stand there with just a good old fashioned garden hose, or I still use a watering can for my small garden, and that works just fine. What you wanna do is water your plants early in the day, generally early in the morning, because you wanna keep the leaves as dry as you can. Because remember, wet leaves really, really favor these fungal leaf spots. Dry leaves are a good way to help avoid fungal leaf spots. Now, we can't do anything about when it rains at 5 o'clock in the afternoon or 7 o'clock at night and it leaves everything wet overnight. You can't go out there with a paper towel and dry things off, but you don't want to add these problems with your irrigation. So really try to avoid using overhead irrigation very late in the day or early in the evening. As a general rule, you want to try to put all your plants to bed dry at night. So remember that when you put into bed at night, you want the leaves to be as dry as you can uh, control and do. Sanitation is important because when the leaves on your plants start to get these spots on them and fall off and now they're laying on the ground, those leaves are covered with fungal spores, uh, bacterial cells. If your problem is a bacterial disease, you want to pick those leaves up and very carefully get rid of them. That helps to reduce the number of fungal spores and the amount of disease you have in your garden overall. Mulching your vegetables really, really helps because if you don't mulch and you have bare soil underneath your vegetables, when we start to get those heavy afternoon rains, when the raindrops hit the ground really hard, they splash dirt up onto the undersides of the leaves at the very bottom of your plants. And do you know where all those fungal spores are hiding out? They're hiding out in the soil in your garden. Do you know where the bacterial cells are hiding out right now? They're in the soil. So you want to try to keep the soil off your plants and your plant leaves as best you can. So mulching with, uh, and there's a lot of different mulches on the market now. The plastic ones work well. They have color plastic ones that work well. Um, just mulching with ground leaves, grass clippings, things like that. That works well. Anything that's going to try to keep the soil off of your plants. And then fungicides, fungicides work also, but fungicides, homeowner available fungicides only work as preventatives. So if you have a plant, let's say you have a tomato plant right now and all the leaves are brown, they all have brown spots on them, they're all starting to fall off. If you use a fungicide, it won't fix those leaves. It won't make the brown and black spots go away it won't repair the plant and make the leaves healthy again. What a fungicide does is when you spray it on the little tiny new emerging leaves, it protects them and keeps them from having the fungus basically germinate and emerge on that leaf and poke into the leaf and start to cause a spot on it. So fungicides applied on a pretty regular basis can be a very, very effective um, method of preventing diseases 
but it's not going to turn a disease around and repair the leaves that are already affected by those spots. There are a number of fungicides that are labeled to be used on um, edible crops. You always want to make sure the fungicide you're using is labeled to be used on the types of vegetables you're going to use it on. Don't go out there and grab a fungicide that's labeled for your lawn or for your roses or for your ornamental plants because it's probably a fungicide that's not safe to be used on something you're going to eat or labeled to be used on those plants. So it may not be effective and it may not be safe also. So you don't want to use them. Uh, a couple examples of fungicides that are labeled for a wide variety of vegetables, any kind of copper fungicide. And copper has been used for many, many, many years by commercial growers. It's still the number one fungicide used by citrus growers. So copper fungicide should be labeled for whatever kind of vegetables you want to use it on. And there's other products at the store. If you just look for a vegetable fungicide and read the label carefully, it's probably going to be safe to use and effective in your vegetable garden. So that's about all I have, but I want to remind everybody coming up this Thursday and every Thursday, we have our virtual plant clinic here. Uh, we do this also on Zoom, starts at 10 a.m. If you go to our Facebook page, you're going to find the Zoom link that you click on and go into that just as you came into our class here today. That's going to be every Thursday at 10 a.m. It's a very casual. If you have any kind of questions about your lawn or garden or vegetables or trees or whatever it might be, um, snake questions, I'm not very good with snakes. So, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer your snake questions. Uh, bird questions, I can't identify birds very well, but I'll find somebody who can. So feel free to jump right into our virtual plant clinic, 10 o'clock Thursday mornings. I have my co-host, Lily, our Florida friendly landscape agent. She helps me. I always push the hard questions off on her. Don't tell her I do that. But be sure to jump in here Thursdays at 10 a.m. If you have a, que a question and you have a picture, go ahead and email that picture to me before the plant clinic, and I'll go ahead and have it all loaded up so we can share your picture with everybody, and that way everybody can learn from your question, your problem, it's a very fun, casual kind of group learning experience. We all kind of learn from each other. So check that out. That's going to be every Thursday at 10 a.m. And if you have any kind of questions, feel free to call. If you call our office number, we are not at the office right now. Offices um, closed for walk-in traffic. But if you call that phone number, Teresa will answer it. And she's more than happy to help you out, answer your question, forward it on to me, whatever it might be. And here is my email address, wlester at ufl.edu. So feel free to shoot me an email, shoot me a picture, shoot some interesting pictures that I can share on the uh, weekly virtual plant clinic. And that would be great. So let me go ahead and get closed out of this and come back to get off of screen sharing. Okay, I should be back on here and visible to everybody. <gasps> we probably have a whole bunch of questions on here. So how are we doing here? Let me go ahead and get through a couple questions. Um, Jen asked, is growing the cool season veggies in the shade an option? That's a really good question, Jen. And the answer is yes to a certain extent. So you can extend the season, like I said, out in the middle of your garden, in the middle of your backyard, those cool season vegetables are gonna to start to decline and be affected by and look pretty bad from the heat starting middle of March. A lot of times it starts to warm up pretty quickly starting about March 15th, but by the end of March, they're going to be heading downhill. Now, if you use shade cloth or you have those cool season vegetables planted in a spot where let's say plants and trees start to grow and it starts to cast shade on it, you can extend the season a little bit. But once we get out, out about um, early, mid, late April, 
What the problem is, is the humidity and the length of the day and the heat, not even so much the heat during the day, but the warmth and the high temperatures at night, all those combine and conspire to basically cause the cool season vegetables to decline. So even though I'll, I'll hear from people who have lettuce and kale and carrots and things like that still growing in the heat of summer, the quality of the produce starts to decline pretty rapidly. And nobody wants to eat fresh garden carrots and lettuce and kale that doesn't taste very good. So basic recommendation is plan on filling your garden with those kind of things in winter, grow a whole bunch of extra and preserve and freeze and can and dry everything that you can and you know kind of save that for the warm time of year and try to save the cool season things for more uh during winter um and said i was thinking of growing lettuce in window boxes in my lanai that like i said that will work to a certain extent i have grown lettuce and mescaline mix in the heat of summer in a greenhouse where it was scorching hot when I was still at University of Florida um, doing a internship at the University of Florida's research center over in Apopka and the lettuce and mescaline greens germinated they came up they did really well but we could only grow them to be about what would this be three inches tall tops before they started to bolt so you can grow those things and basically create microgreens or baby lettuces. But what you're gonna to have to do is pick them when they're about three inches high or so. But you can start a lot of window boxes, plant them, they're gonna come up quickly, they're gonna grow quickly. You're gonna pick baby greens and then you're gonna to have to plant more. So that, that setup will work, but trying to grow lettuce or romaine all the way to maturity in the heat is gonna bolt long before um, it gets to mature size. So Annette asks, what fruits are in season now and when warm and then which are good to grow during cool season? So Annette, if you're asking about fruits, um, a lot of times what you wanna do is just follow the UPIC farms, go on Facebook. Right now is blueberry season, we have a lot of UPIC uh, blueberry farms that are in Hernando County. There's a lot of them in Pasco County, just over the county line. In this area, we have quite a few. We're coming up on blackberry season, so pretty soon we do have a few you pick blackberry uh, growers here in the county. And blackberries are something that can do really, really well. I know researchers at UF are still working with the growers to figure out the right varieties of blackberries, what's going to work um, the best. But you want to try to follow the uh, commercial growers and see what they're picking and figure out that's what you should be picking also. Sarah asks, how do you get rid of leaf miners? That's a very good question. I also think they might be in my compost is every time I use it, the plant is leaf miners. No, leaf miners are very, very tiny either flies or moths. So leaf miners can fit or fall into two different um, classes of insects. They might be little moths, they might be tiny little flies. What they do is they lay their eggs on a leaf of your plants and the immature um, fly, which is technically a maggot, or the immature moth, which is technically a caterpillar, drills into the leaf and they crawl around and they eat out and cause little tunnels in the center of your leaf. Leaf miners can, are a really, really common problem with tomatoes, cucumbers, anybody who still has citrus trees, they always get leaf miners. And if you look hard, you'll find them on a lot of other plants also. A few leaf miners are not a huge problem, but if you start to get a lot of leaf miners on your plants and you're looking for something to spray that's gonna control them, that's safe to use also, and not gonna be really dangerous for you, the kiddos, or the environment. There is a product, and you guys can go ahead and write this down, called Spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And you can find um, products that contain Spinosad, 
uh, big box stores, lawn and garden centers, and it's very easy to find online also. You can order a bottle of it. It's usually a liquid that you're gonna mix with the appropriate amount of water, spray on your plants, spin a sab. It's interesting, it's a species of bacteria they found that is very toxic to caterpillars, thrips, which can also be a problem, and uh, leaf miner larva. And the reason why it works is when you spray it on a leaf, it goes into the leaf. It's actually translaminar. I guess that's the vocabulary word for today is translaminar. That means when you spray it on the leaf, it goes into the leaf where the leaf miner larva is and it's gonna kill it. Anything else you spray on it, insecticidal soap, neem oil, uh, whatever else you might wanna spray on the outside, seven malathion sits on the outside of the leaf and the leaf miner is cozy and happy and waving at you from the inside center of the leaf because that uh, insecticide is not getting to it and it's not gonna control it. So for leaf miners, get spinosad. Spinosad works very, very well on leaf miners. Works well on caterpillars also. So I mentioned BT for caterpillars. Another good control for caterpillars is spinosad. Uh, Rebecca asked, does DE or diatomaceous earth work for pest management? Yes, Rebecca, it does, but only in certain situations. DE works very well for um, very small insects because what DE or diatomaceous earth is, is, is diatoms and diatoms, they dig up out of the earth. It's the um, ancient remains of diatoms. Diatoms, think of a little tiny snail with a shell. That's what diatoms are or were, but they're microscopic. Millions of them, you know, lived and died millions of years ago. They ended up on the ocean floor. They were packed down. Now they're under the ground and we can dig them up. So what it is, is basically prehistoric shells that we grind up into a powder. So if you look at it, it looks like talcum powder. But if you're a really, really tiny insect walking across it, it looks like broken glass. It's very sharp and dangerous for them and helps control them. Uh, a, a lot of people use diatomaceous earth with raising chickens, but I'm not an expert on chickens. We do have a workshop coming up for anybody interested in raising chickens, but I know they use it a lot. Uh, diatomaceous earth, you can use as a dust to dust your plants and the ground around them with. It helps deter insects, but the problem with DE is when it rains, it's all gone. It completely washes away and breaks down, goes into the soil. So you're gonna to have to keep reapplying it. DE can work mostly as a deterrent, not so much for vegetable plants as an actual control. What, if anything, can be used as a preventative measure against pests? Lena, that's a good question. Um, I would say the best thing you could do for controlling pests is scouting. Just be diligent, get out there and check your plants every day, every other day, um, definitely. And go out there and just be aware of and keep on top of everything that is in your garden and everything that might be on your plants. Keep in mind, most of the insects that you see out there are actually beneficial insects. So things like ladybugs, uh, green lacewing larva, um, different uh, fly larvae um, that might be feeding on aphids. Those are all beneficial insects. So you're gonna have to do a little learning. There's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve with identifying insects, but don't worry if you don't know what it is, just get a picture and send it to me. I can tell you exactly whether it's good, bad, what it is and what to do to control it. But scouting and catching insect problems when they're little problems is the best preventative measure you could do because if you ignore things, and your insect problems become big problems, a lot of times there's nothing you can do. You're not gonna be able to save the plants. And a lot of times there's not a whole lot that we can recommend for you to do that's gonna be effective and in the long term work. So scouting, best measure to help control insects. Is it too late to grow bean or pumpkins from seeds? 
you can still get in there if you're going to grow bush beans and get them planted really, really soon. I'm still going to try to plant bush beans. So I'm going to have some videos about how well that does. Technically, I should have, we should have planted our beans back in March, but you can still get them in. Uh, the nice thing is beans grow generally pretty fast and they're generally pretty, they do get pests, but they're generally pretty productive. You're always going to get some beans off of them. So you can squeeze in beans. Pumpkins, you may want to save until fall. And when I say fall, I think the time for planting them is mid-July, mid-August. And it's really hard to get pumpkins in time to pick for Halloween. But you know what you can grow here in the spring, early in the spring to the fall, is pie pumpkins. And for anybody who's eaten pumpkins before, pumpkin is a winter squash. And pumpkins are make for a really, really good vegetable to go with dinner. So don't think that, you know, acorn squash is the only hard squash you can grow. You can grow pie pumpkins, cut them in half, cook them the same way that you would an acorn squash. And that's a really delicious uh, vegetable to have with dinner. So try growing pumpkins to eat. Pumpkins just for looks and the great big pumpkins is really hard to grow them here. So jack-o'-lantern pumpkins, yeah, don't make a jack-o'-lantern. Go ahead and eat them. They taste a lot better than they look. So does sweet potato need a lot of sun to grow? I have a plant partially shaded by a tree. Sweet potatoes are gonna grow well in full sun, two partial shade. They can handle some shade. Most vegetables are gonna appreciate a little bit of shade in the heat of summer, um, a little bit of shade late in the day. So sweet potatoes, they'll do well, where it's partially shaded. The sunnier you can get it, the better they're gonna grow because full sun and heat really doesn't bother sweet potatoes. What are the type of pests to look out for on um, banana, mango, and avocado trees? Um, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is avocados in Hernando County. We're starting to see a lot of avocado lace bug. So CG, go ahead and write that one down and look it up. Avocado lace bug. University of Florida has a lot of information online about that. They're very easy to identify, but they're very small. So if I take a leaf and toss it under the microscope, I can tell right away, boom, that's avocado uh, lace bugs. Insecticidal soap is gonna work well to control them, but they can be very damaging. They're gonna damage a lot of leaves. So you wanna keep an eye on them and control them. So CG, we're gonna have a lot, I think I'm saying that right now. We're gonna have a lot of little short videos coming up. I have master gardeners that grow bananas and mangoes and avocados. And we're gonna have a whole series of little short, just five, 10 minute videos on different points. So I'll be sure, I'll remember that one and I'll be sure to tell that to my master gardener that's gonna make them on bananas, mangoes and avocados. So keep following us on Facebook and we're gonna have all those little videos made soon and up. What about protecting from other critters? Squirrels, armadillos, possums. Armadillos and possums can be fenced out. Uh, rabbits are another example of something that you need a fence to keep out. Deer, deer, you need a big fence. Deer, there is no easy cure. You can't just sprinkle um, soap or uh, fur from your dog or something like that and have it be a reliable control. A lot of times putting things out to deter deer will confuse them and scare them for a little bit and then eventually they get over their fear and just push right past it and go back to eating your garden again. Uh, squirrels are a really tough one because fences don't keep out squirrels. Squirrels will jump over and get in your garden Squirrels will cheerfully eat your tomatoes, your peppers, other things. Um, squirrels are a tough one. You just need to do whatever you need to do to try to keep them out of your garden. Spraying your garden with a hot pepper spray, and you can look online for um, information on that. That's basically taking some really hot peppers, running them through a blender, straining them out, adding them to water and spraying with that. That's a good deterrent because squirrels don't want to eat tomatoes that taste like hot pepper. You know, squirrels don't generally like hot pepper. 
Um, I could tell you from personal experience, we have two Huskies. They're being very, very quiet this morning, thankfully. Huskies are a very, very good um, squirrel deterrent because they dream of catching a squirrel and working together to uh, dispatch of that squirrel. So, you know, fencing in your garden, but letting the dogs patrol the area around it would work well also. Other than that, there is no surefire, easy solution to keeping animals out other than the fencing and trying some of the other um, recommendations to deter them for at least a little bit. Susan asks, is spraying with neem or other products effective as a preventative? Are these things harmful to the good insects you mentioned? Neem, like I said, and I've read up on it a little bit, neem is kind of an unusual mixed bag. Because neem, even if you go and buy, if we were to all buy three different brands of neem oil, all, we go to Amazon.com and buy three different brands, and we send all three off to a lab to test them, they're not going to be the exact same. There's a lot of um, variety and chemical differentials between different um, uh, name brands of neem oil. Neem, if you spray it, it will deter some insects because neem is very distasteful for some and they don't like the taste. So it deters them from feeding on your plants. For other insects, neem makes that oily covering. So sometimes with white flies and other insects, they won't even land on your leaves that have neem on them. With other insects, neem will kill them. They will feed on the leaves and spray with neem and it will actually cause their death. And with plenty of other insects, insects land, and it's like, they don't even care about the neem. It doesn't stop them at all. Neem does have some fungicidal properties. So it will actually work as a fairly decent fungicide for powdery mildew and a few other things. <clears throat> but with other fung fungal problems, neem doesn't work at all. So neem is a really, really mixed bag. As a general rule, it's not dangerous for people if you follow the directions and use the correct um, uh, protective gear and spray it correctly, follow the directions. It can and does kill beneficial insects. So if you take neem oil, my guess is if you spray it on a bunch of uh, ladybugs, it will kill them. So many of these uh, products will kill beneficial insects just as well as it kills the pest insects. So that's why scouting and education is so important. If you look at your plants and you see pests, but you know you see a lot of beneficial insects on there also, maybe you don't need to spray today. Maybe those ladybugs are doing a pretty good job of keeping the aphids under control. Maybe you wanna come back and check them again tomorrow or the next day and see who's winning. Because if you observe insects, you know, beneficial insects, on a plant that has pest insects, the ladybugs will start to win. You see a whole bunch of them. Then the ladybugs fly away, like the little song says. The aphids get the upper hand, so you always want to be weighing uh, and monitoring the relative populations of it. So it might sound kind of complicated, but to put it in really simple terms, it's a matter of watching your plants very closely being aware of just what's going on and who the heck is living in your vegetable garden and making decisions every day about, do I spray? Do I not spray? What do I spray with? Do I wait to spray? And these, if you follow that um, line of thinking, and if basically those are all different steps of integrated pest management or IPM, and that's what we strongly recommend, you're gonna find that you end up with a much better chance of having a very successful vegetable garden and getting a much better crop. So, so last question here, last comment, because it's starting to get a little bit late. Uh, CG, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, said she Googled avocado lace bugs. I think that's my problem. Do you spray the leaves with the insecticidal soap or just where I find the bugs? Insecticidal soap is going to actually physically kill uh, the uh, avocado lace bugs. So you need to turn over the leaves and physically do your best to hit the insects with the insecticidal soap spray. And that is going to kill 99% of them. You're going to have to come back and check.
because if only a few survive or a few come in from your neighbors or somewhere else, what they do is they make babies and the population goes up really, really quickly. So with insecticidal soap, you're gonna to have to be diligent and keep checking. One spray may control the problem or get it to the point where you only have a few of them now, but they may come back. You may need a second application in a week or two weeks, something like that. So be diligent, get some insecticidal soap, spray it actually on the avocado lace bugs, and that is the strongest spray you need. You don't need to go to the store and get all the, the things that kill everything under the sun on your plants. Insecticidal soap is gonna work just great on avocado lace bugs, and that's really all you need in your toolbox there. Uh, Jen said, just wanted to say thanks to everyone involved with making these meetings happen. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We really love hearing these uh, uh, thank yous and little positive comments here. If anybody has any ideas for topics you want to hear about, anything that we could do to improve our classes, whether it be the days, the times, we're open to any and all suggestions. Like I said, go ahead and shoot me an email, call our office number. Teresa's still answering the phones. She's more than happy to take your suggestions and comments and pass them on to the appropriate person. I think this is great. I think this gives us a way to um, get this information to many more people because obviously we had, I see right now we have 26 participants on here. I'm going to take this and save it as a video, put it on Facebook. That way even more people could see it. We're going to save it on YouTube. More people are going to see it. So this is a really, really good way for us to start a conversation with people, get people involved. And get you thinking about how am I going to go about running my vegetable garden? Oh my gosh, I have a bug on my plant. Who on earth do I ask to identify it? Well, that would be me. So now remember, get a good picture or um, a good description, send it to me and we'll help you out with that. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. Everybody stay safe out there. Remember to tune in on Thursday as our next is my next Zoom presentation. That is our weekly plant clinic. So feel free to, to uh, zoom in with that one and we will see you then. So everybody take care and thank you very much for coming.